Okay, so this is my birthday celebration of Mindful Social Blabcast. And I'm really excited to have Rachel Miller with me. You know, we've kind of known each other through social media for a long time, but we've never actually met. So this is going to be really fun, and I'm really glad you could be here. No, I'm super stoked to be here, uh, especially on your birthday. But yes, we have known each other for several years on social, so it's always super cool to uh, do shows like this. Yeah, it's bizarre, isn't it? Why don't you tell people who don't know about you a little bit about you and what you do and about why Listen More is your tagline? So Yes, yeah, so my name is Rachel Miller. I am currently a social strategist at Pure Matter. So I am super blessed to work with Brian Kramer and his amazing team. Um, I, yes, I, I'm a big advocate for social listening and just listening in general. I feel um, a lot of people are very quick to kind of wait to speak versus listening. And I think in, in, in real life and, and most especially on social, there's a lot of shouting. So um, social listening is definitely an underutilized strategy for businesses. Um, and active listening is an awesome skill when you meet people in person. <laughs> so <laughs> um, big advocate all around. Well, I have to say I'm, I suck at active listening because I'm always like, I'm going to forget what I'm going to say. So let's talk about two things then. What First off, what do you mean by listening on social? So social listening by definition is purely the act of, you know, monitoring all of your social channels. But you really need to take it a little bit deeper and listen to conversations, not just about, you know, what your customers are saying, your potential customers, but everything in and around your areas of expertise and what you're hoping to achieve as a business professional and then like the services or products that you're trying to sell. Um, I really think outside the box because a lot of people who you might be marketing to don't actually know that they need what you're selling. Mm -hmm. So you kind of need to get creative with, um, if I didn't know what you did, like how would it be described? Like think of the lay person on the street, like how would they describe what you do? Or when you meet somebody at a coffee shop, like how do you describe what you do. Um, so they're not going to be maybe looking for, you know, business to business, you know, marketing opportunities. They're going to be thinking of, you know, something a little bit different. So, um, and putting those search terms into tools and um, finding those conversations leads to amazing opportunities and uh, not just prospects, but, you know, friends and potential just colleagues. So what kind of uses can that be besides um, getting to know what your customers want or what they're interested in what other kinds of uses are there for social listening like professional development or you know i'm not gonna put words in your mouth <laughs> um so i guess for me so twitter is you know hands down my favorite social network um and i find a lot of conversations um from like a, a pure like an educational standpoint like for something that's interesting to me like social listening like find keeping abreast of new tools um, mm -hmm. Just for monitoring conversations like startups or um, you, you can I mean, you can find anything that you happen to be interested in, like cooking. <laughs> I'm a huge cook. I can find recipes for lasagna on Twitter. Um, <laughs> so really, it's just kind of, you know, putting your, you know, getting your ears out there um, and you can listen to anything. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a huge Twitter fan, too. I think it's probably my one number one network that I go to um, for information, news, everything. You know, it's really an amazing resource. And so many people um, now I'm hearing a lot of people saying, you know, Twitter is full of junk and it's all full of spammers and those kind of conversations. But I really kind of think that that's based on the network that you've developed there. If you followed anybody who followed you, that's pretty much what you're going to get. No, you're right. And again, I like, there's a lot of talk out there about content overload. And again, it's you don't have to listen to everything that's being said. It's it, I think we're we're so lucky right now that we can find exactly what we're searching for. You just mm -hmm. have to you know put a little bit of effort in uh, to hone your feed. You're right. Like you don't have to follow everybody at, back that follows you. You know, customize all of your notifications on your devices, your Facebook feed, your LinkedIn streams, and um, you can still be connected to you know our our networks these days are. are unfathomably large. <laughs> it's overwhelming Absolutely. if you look and see how many people you're actually connected to, but the ones that are most important um, is probably a, kind of a much smaller number. Um, mm -hmm. And it, knowing who's important and what they're saying, I think is kind of um, at the root of all of it. 
So let's follow up on that a little bit and, and tell people how can you customize those notifications or fine tune your feed so that you're not having to listen to all of that noise and you can actually maybe focus a little bit better. Um, so I'm a, I'm a big list person on mm -hmm. all of my networks, even Facebook. I go so far as to create, you know, the, the little lists of, you know, important contacts, um, most definitely on Twitter. So one of my favorite tools is if this, then that, I think mm -hmm. it's, um, it doesn't get the acknowledgements that it deserves. So I push a lot of searches to Twitter lists, and then I then port them into Hootsuite for additional segmentation. Um, and it's, it keeps my listening really easy. Um, I can go into my Hootsuite dashboard and all of you know my important, the people who are important to me right now, and that does fluctuate depending on what project I'm working on. Or, um, but it, just having it at a glance is super important. So lists, and that works on LinkedIn. Um, does take a little bit of time to educate yourself on what you're able to do and definitely customize your notifications. I have different notifications on my phone and my iPad and my laptop. Um, mm -hmm. So I know when I'm on a certain device, what's important to me. So if I'm on my laptop, I get, you know, different email pushes versus on my phone. It might be something a little bit different. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I, I get so many notifications because we manage accounts for clients and I get all of their notifications on my phone. So I used to say... <laughs> I have I like seven different Twitter accounts attached to this phone, but I have them all turned off. I go into them manually um, to check them. Otherwise, it would be flashing constantly. The battery would never stay charged. <laughs> yeah, I, I have that problem for sure. I have to turn off notifications when I'm at a conference, for example, because I don't have as much battery. But I want to be keeping on, on top of things that are happening with their accounts. And rather than being obsessive about going in and you know checking them all, I'm being obsessive by just looking at my phone and glancing at it, getting the notification and then deciding if I need to deal with it or not. And 90% of the time I don't. So maybe it's just crazy. <laughs> <laughs> it would be nice if you could be selective. I wish you could get like a push for maybe a DM versus mm -hmm. just a mention would be super cool. Um, Cause those are typically a little bit more important than your average mention. Um, yeah. Something for the Twitter people if they're listening. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm sure they're listening. And if they are listening, 10,000 char characters is stupid. <laughs> That's, I, 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 uh, I'm so not sure how, what my side is on that argument. Um, I hope it doesn't ruin the Twitter experience because I'm a naturally very concise speaker. I, I don't like to ramble. So Twitter for me, I think that's why I fell in love with it early on. It's like, if you can't put what you need to say in 140 characters, you're not exactly. well versed in the topic. Um, however, as a caveat to that, I have had much more of an enjoyable time with direct messages since they increased the character limit because mm -hmm. people can actually explain why they're contacting you versus just having to truncate it. So maybe that will be the same. <laughs> well, if you have a good network, then you can accept direct messages from people. You know, I mean, I get very few direct messages and when they are, there's something that actually matters to me. They're very rarely you know, junk, because if you junk spam me once, that's it. You're done. You're blocked. You'll never talk to me again. So, um, yeah, DMs, DMs being longer has been more useful to me. And, you know, for negotiating people to come on the show, you know, we can have a conversation on Twitter and not need to go to email because my email is actually worse than my Twitter stream. At yes. This point. Or I know for a short while we couldn't put links in direct messages. Ugh. That was very inconvenient. Yes. <laughs> To say the so, least. And I understood why they tried that because, you know, a lot of spammers would send you links, bad things were happening. But from, you know, the, the people who were not abusing the platform, links mm -hmm. were very helpful. Um, so, you know, I, I like that they're experimenting and they, they are quick to change when, you know, public opinion says it sucks. So <laughs> yeah. I'm willing to try the 10,000 characters and perhaps, you know, if the feedback is negative, then maybe they'll go back to what it was before. Hmm. Well, we'll see if they do it at all. I think a lot of these things are rumors that, you know, they kind of put out there to see what the response is. Not that Twitter has always been like really great about listening to their users, but. Well, it know. is a really good way to crowdsource, you know, you know, yeah. just leak it a little bit and see what they say. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that actually, maybe they are listening to see if that'll work. We'll find out, I guess, pretty soon. <laughs> Yes, that's what they say. End of Q1, I think is what it was the, the rumors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how can we be active listeners on, on social? Because 
okay, on, on Twitter, you know, you're getting that staccato thing or you're getting posts on Facebook. You're going to see the comments maybe before, but how does, how does active listening work with social media? For me, a lot of it comes down to the tools and it's notifications. Um, so I use, I'm, I am lucky now at Agency Life with Pure Meta, I have access to a lot of amazing tools, but a lot of my favorites are the free tools that I've been using for a long time. So um, there's a tool called Mention that is awesome for putting in like, you, you know, your business name, you know, your, your actual first and last name and for phrases, perhaps, you know, the full blog post title, whatever you happen to be tracking at the moment. Um, there's a new tool called Sales Prodigy. Um, which they set it up for more of a social selling purpose. So you can listen to, you know, potential prospects, but it's amazing for social mm. listening. Um, good old Google alerts still work just fine. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and I use just Twitter a lot as well. Um, and I, being active is you selective. It, it pushes all of your mentions um, to one place. Your my it's for me, it's my inbox. And I just kind of scroll through and see which ones are important to me. And that's kind of a gut instinct, like which ones do you respond to? But it's, it's being aware. And I think that's key. You need to be aware of what's being said about you, where your name is used, um, your product or service, and then jumping into the conversation at the right time. Right, right. I find Google Alerts still to be really slow, but I don't. Have you tried um, BuzzSumo? Yes. Yeah, I really like them too because you know it's a great way to track things and and get that information and then find sources that you can share. You know, when you curate a lot, and I do curate a lot, finding sources that aren't the same old same old people that you're always resharing from is humongous. Have you tried uh, Crate? It's a new tool. Actually, I just found out about it a couple of days ago. Um, it's the way that it's a curation tool, but you're able to curate via a publication, but then add a person's Twitter handle as kind of a way of filtering whether you want that content or not. Huh. It's no, a, I haven't. Um, we'll have, for curation. Mm -hmm. We'll have to find that and put the link up on the, uh, I think on the blog. Get Crate. I think uh, Kristen Kurtos is in the blab watching. I think she's uh, one of my fellow tool oh, donkeys. She just did. Thank you, Christine. Yeah, that's a good one. I like, um, uh, uh oh, now I can't remember the name of it. Um, Scoop It. Yeah, that's another it one. That's awesome. I was a, so great. Did you ever use Sway? No. There was a tool that was around for a couple of years. It actually no longer exists, but it was, um, it's very similar to Crate. Um, curation is an, I, it's a constant evolution for me. Um, I used to read 100% of everything that I shared on social. Um, and that's hard to keep up with. Now mm -hmm. I think I'm honestly down to maybe 50%. I have my trusted sources that I will blind share, but I still like to read everything um, that's new that I'm not familiar with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are certain people that, you know, I know what they're sharing is gonna be good. And I can read the title and, and say, you know, is that gonna pertain to my network or not? Um, but yeah, I, I probably, I think I'm probably, I hope that I'm 75%, but it's probably not true. That's admirable. <laughs> But you I'm have trying. to. I mean, I always coach clients to at least skim because, you know, some people have very catchy blog titles, but they might not mm -hmm. always be relevant or there's a mention of a competitor like somewhere in the middle. So you do need to, you know, at least glance at it. Yeah, absolutely. That That's a big one. And I, I think everybody's done it, you know, shared a post because the title was so appropriate and it seems spot on. And then you read it and go, oh, man, it's exactly the opposite of what I thought it was. So, yes. And there's that huge discrepancy. And that's probably a conversation for a whole other uh, podcast. But um, just time on page like this. So you can see a post and it has thousands of social shares. But if you were to go a little bit deeper and look at their Google Analytics, um, it's always disappointing when there's, you know, a minute spent on the page and it's like a thousand word post. <laughs> yeah. Is it converting? <laughs> Same thing with videos. You know, if you look at videos on Facebook, for example, if it shows up in your stream, you that counts as a view, even if you never actually watched it. So they, you know, you get these thousands and thousands of views, but how many people actually got the message or got to the call to action at the end? Which is and that's always, because they autoplay, correct? Is that where it's? Yeah, yeah, yeah. As soon as it as soon as it rolls through your stream, if your page is open and and there's a video on it, then it's been viewed. And that's yeah, kind of I think there needs to be a commit action there. You need to hit play 
and then it counts as a view. I agree. I agree. So if anybody has any questions for Rachel or I, please post them. Uh, you just do slash Q. And I see there's a discussion going on in the chat about Nuzzle. Um, have you used Nuzzle much? I have. Um, it reminds me kind of, if I'm thinking of the, I, I know I get the emails. Um, if it's more like Newsly, is that where it pulls in mentions of your contacts? Is that the, if I'm thinking of the yeah. tool? Yeah. Or it, so -and -so it is shares sharing content this. that they're sharing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I found it to be really clunky on the mobile and I do almost all of my sharing from mobile. Um, so, you know, it's kind of, it'll crash connecting with a network or whatever. But I think the idea of here's what all your friends are sharing is good for professional development or keeping on top of things. But if all my friends are sharing it, why do I want to share it too? Exactly. No, I, I was actually, I was going to say something very similar because exactly, it, it's good to know what's kind of trending in your network, but why would you want to reshare it? Because it's already been shared by everybody you know. So chances are your community has caught, you know, already seen it. So, right. yeah. It's like sharing Mashable for the thousandth time. You know, it's like, really, does, do people really need to see it a thousand times? <laughs> was it good yeah. in the first place? <laughs> for that one uh, person. Yeah. yeah. Kristen says she likes Feedly for creating too. I use that a lot and I import it into Sprout Social, which is my tool instead of who I've kind of moved over from Hootsuite. Um, I don't know if you use Feedly as far as RSS feed readers go. I have in the past um, for RSS, I'm actually using Buffer right now as my, oh. my go-to. Um, I like their help. It's easy to schedule the way they have it set up. Yeah, they're new. The pro tools are really good. They're really good. I use those too. Yeah. Yeah. There's we're, we're fortunate. There's a lot of uh, easy ways to curate these days. Yeah, there are. And I think um, a lot of people don't understand what curation really means as far as, yeah, you can share a bunch of links, but when you put that all together, how does that represent your brand? So can we talk a little bit about that and, and how you think curation can help or hurt a brand? Well, it most definitely can help. And you would hope, I think the benefit of reading all the content before you share it is it should echo your sentiments and it should be mm -hmm. helping you in build up your thought leadership. Like you didn't write the actual piece of content, but it's still promoting what you believe in. Um, so that's where you, it can hurt a brand if they start blind sharing and it's talking negative or it's, you know, discussing topics that might not be beneficial to their community or even a little bit polarizing. Um, mm -hmm. and it's fine, I think, to be a little bit controversial if you kind of want to throw something out there to start a conversation. But again, you need to be listening to catch those comments. Um, you can't just keep pushing out, you know, content and not seeing how people are responding because the goal should be just be starting conversations. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's why people get a little crazy if they're sharing every 15 minutes. Um, if people are listening and writing you back, you can't possibly keep up with that, especially as an individual. Um, but if you are taking a more personalized approach and sharing things, um, even going somewhere, you know, you customize the link, don't just share the same title as the author because everybody's seeing that same, but, you know, read the post. Sometimes I'll take like one of the, the subtitles if I'm, you know, if I'm in a hurry <laughs> or I like to, you know, like read this, you know, put something in there to kind of, it, it should be a conversation starter in my opinion. Mm -hmm. I think that's true. And, and, you know, actually reading the posts and, yeah, we don't always do it, but reading the post actually gives the author a lot of credit, you know, and, and I think they really appreciate that, that you actually pulled something that was useful out of what they wrote and share that instead of just their title. Um, you know, it, it makes them feel better and maybe it explains the topic a little bit better, too. I agree. Hmm. Um, and then so, so I we have a, a question I see from Brian. Um, yeah, I was just going on there too. I'm just going to take over the show. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. Well, so Brian asked, what role does good creation play in setting you up for good social listening? So I'll let you answer that. I think that kind of plays into what we were just discussing. If you're, you're, you're starting a conversation and then you're listening. So if you reverse that and you're listening first, you kind of know what people are wanting to hear um, or what would be a good conversation starter. Um, mm -hmm. to connect with your community. Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. And, and creating really 
um, you can't just listen, right? <laughs> you actually, right. <laughs> so um, for a brand that's listening a lot, there's been a lot of talk about automation. There's been a lot of examples where uh, brands have gotten into a lot of trouble with automation. Um, they may be thinking they're listening. They may be trying to listen, but are they really paying attention if they send an automated answer? And let's just talk about that for a second. So an automated answer. So you mean like, for example, when someone follows you and they shoot you that DM that says, follow me on LinkedIn. <laughs> well, not so much, but like there's a really great example about um, a B of A, I think that there was a protester out in front during, you know, the Occupy. And he was saying, I'm just being hauled off by the police from in front of Bank of America. And a customer service rep responded with, how can I help you? And then it escalated from there. So I think that kind of automation, although it seems like a good idea at the time, um, may not be the best thing that they could do. No. So obviously that's a, an amazing example of uh, gone bad. Um, and I think it's just, it's out of convenience. We have the technology. Um, I'm a huge advocate for social automation, um, but there should be the ability to override it in certain situations. Like there should still be a human behind it. Um, and there are a lot of amazing tools right now where they, it is an automated messaging service, but you would never know. And that, again, it's taking the time before you push the, the go button to really customize it to the types of messages you might be expecting. Um, mm -hmm. That one, uh, you can't expect everybody mentioning you is looking for help. So that, that I would never um, advise anybody to set up a, an automation as limited as that. <laughs> Right. Well, and I think in this case, it was actually a customer service rep who'd been given a script that was absolutely basically a push button. OK, if somebody says help, this is this is you click this and then you click this and then you click that. And I think that's something that brands do a lot. They have automated responses or scripts that they want you to respond to. Um, you know, it's like when you call AT&T and you have to listen to the whole speech and you're just like, just solve my problem. So. Yes, uh, I mean, maybe it's, it's not just listening, it's also reading. Because <laughs> not every <laughs> sentence that has help in it is, uh, you know, but. Uh, yeah, it's not all relevant. Uh, exactly. Brian has another question too, and he says, how do personal brands and thought leaders scale their listening? Outsource vis-a-vis vis -vis better tools and decreasing the amount of engagement. Ooh. That's a good that question. Is, I know that is a struggle for definitely a lot of uh, my friends and colleagues you know you do when you professional success also comes with an uh, exorbitant amount of contacts these days um, and I think it, it comes down to a judgment call you can be that person that responds to every mention or you can be the one that only responds to five percent and it's where they say a little bit more than you know perhaps a mention sharing your content I think if someone takes the time to actually craft a message or a question that def most definitely re deserves a response. And there are a lot of tools, you can definitely hire help, but again, w make sure it's business value for you and what what is important because spending money to have somebody respond to every single mention, is that really helping your bottom line? Um, or would you be getting the same return on your investment if you were to respond again to like, you know, 25% of your mentions? So I think you kind of need to try several things, see what works. And if you are seeing a huge value um, in responding to every single mention, then run with it. That's definitely worth the time and energy. But um, I mean, we are lucky there are, you can outsource, there are amazing tools, but every, you know, nothing's free. So even if it's your time, you have to know that it's, you know, it's time it is truly money. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm a big one. I love automation in certain forms, you know, like IFTTT and, and tools like that that can make automation part of, you know, your regular workflow. But sending an automated thank you every time somebody mentions you is definitely going to bite you in the ass at some point, you know. Yeah. And is it is it truly necessary? I think that's mm -hmm. the... Um... I know when my network was smaller, I did <laughs> send everybody who mentioned me, you know, a, a note, but it's, it is impossible to scale. Um, and you just kind of have to, you know, take some, you know, spend some time and audit yourself and your best practices and see what works for you. Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, Jen has a really good question. I'm not going to read the whole thing because it's kind of long, Jen. But basically, uh, what about smaller brands? Is a longer response time better than an automated response? Yes, always. <laughs> Easy answer. <laughs> Most yes. definitely. I think it's <laughs> off-putting when people get that flippant, we see your message, but there's no actual content. There's, it's not contextual. It's not personalized. Um, I think most everybody would rather wait 15, 20 minutes and have an actual response. It's kind of like what we were talking about earlier with the, the scripted responses. You're mm -hmm. not getting your question answered, even though you are engaging with somebody immediately, they're not helping you. So what is the point? So if, I would rather wait than have my problem solved because it may take you just as long going round and round for 15, 20 minutes with the automated system to get your question answered when, you, you know, they could just wait 15 minutes and have an actual person respond with exactly what you need to know. Yeah. After uh, Facebook introduced on their pages um, the function that if you respond really quickly within like five minutes to a message on your page, then you'll get um, basically you get a gold star from Facebook as being having a really high response rate. So what people are doing now is they're automating their response immediately. Um, but some of the, I was working with a customer the other day who had set that up, but then their customer service department wasn't seeing the message because it showed it had already been responded to. So uh, they were automating. Yeah, we saw that. We're going to get to you. And then never answering again because nobody saw it. So it's, it's a weird thing about this. The idea of, yes, we're going to give you stars for being responsive, but people just game it and ruin it anyway. Yeah, I mean, I, I do feel we are kind of, we're at a tipping point. I know I forget what the statistic is right now, but I know time to resolution in for customer service is kind of at an all-time low right now. Um, mm -hmm. And if you are getting a large number of support questions that you know, require time to solve, maybe you do need to invest in more personnel. Um, yeah. But again, I think it's most people would prefer waiting a little bit longer and actually having their problems fixed versus a, a short, super fast message that basically does nothing. Yeah, I think having it, you know, be something that, you know, Jen, Jen points out in the chat that smaller brands could have a 15 to 18 hour response time. And I think that's perfectly appropriate. If you're a small boutique and somebody makes a comment on your Facebook page, you know, or asks a question, I don't think they expect you to be on 24 seven, although you can be if you turn on notifications. <laughs> yes, but you, you have to set the precedent. So maybe if you do have an automated message, alert the customer that that is the time frame. So maybe that would be your, your first response. Like we have received your message. Um, you know, average turnaround time is going to be 15 to 18 hours. Um, and so you, that person is then aware um, and if that's unacceptable to them, then they can, you know, call. Maybe there's additional steps they can take, but at least they know when they can expect a response versus kind of leaving them hanging, um, mm -hmm. which will cause them to get irritated and perhaps, you know, take their problems public. Yeah. And that that's that leads to a really good question, too, is when you see some kind of a negative response on whatever social network it is, um, I think... I want people to, to stop before they respond and actually think about what their response is going to be. But is a negative response always a bad response? No, it, it's not. But I, I do feel it, it's an opportunity to win somebody over. And obviously, sometimes they become your strongest advocates when you have kind of, you know, turn their frown upside down. But I feel we do spend way more time and energy focusing on the negative comments versus the, you know, as we were talking earlier, like the mentions, like perhaps I should respond to all of those mentions because those are positive people that like me. I should give them more love versus, you know, spending all my time responding to the people who have, you know, perhaps mean things to say. <laughs> right, you know, exactly. I'm not going to make them happy either. <laughs> anyways. So but we do because we want everybody to like us. So we focus on the negative. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, we can also look at negatives as an opportunity to learn something about our product or our services and, you know, understand, OK, there is a there could be a problem. And are we going to accept that? Are we going to deal with it? Um, when you see a negative thread, say, on Facebook or something and you respond and say, yeah, you know that we recognize it is a problem and we're going to fix it. At what point do you take it offline 
and try to remove them from the public conversation? I mean, uh, I guess you would like to take it offline as soon as possible, but it is, I think, helpful for other customers and perhaps future customers to see that you respond mm -hmm. to negative comments publicly. I think because we, we are all human and I think it's great if you can be that transparent and leave it up there because you did ultimately fix the problem. Um, and I think that's great, especially if you were able to do it in a timely manner. I think that mm -hmm. shows excellent customer service. So you could leave it up there as kind of a precedent. So let's talk about listening as a function of someone in the organization who's paying attention the most, which is often the case that there's one person in the social team or in the company who's actually managing that listening. How do you take that back to the corporate entity and take it back to the team? What kind of, um, what kind of ways can we use that social listening for the education or, you know, going back and saying, okay, everybody seems to hate the 10,000 <laughs> character of tweet. Well, I think, I mean, with everything that you do, because time is money, you need to have a goal. So what are you listening for? And so you would know that. So if you're listening for customer complaints or product feedback, you can then collate that data and put it into a report and, you know, pass it on to the decision makers. Um, listening for the sake of listening, it, you know, that that is not a useful thing. I think you can't, because there's so much to listen to. Like you could mm -hmm. find answers to any question, but you need to have, a, you know, be hyper-focused. So before you put any tools in place or your search terms, you kind of need to know what, what am I doing here? Like, what is my goal? Like, what do I want to find out, you know, six months from now, a year from now, um, put your listening in place and then you're able to then monitor almost anything. Yeah. Well, if there is say a, a specific person who maybe it's, you know, a crisis response team or uh, just a troubleshooting team, is that something that you run into fairly often in social accounts? That they're listening for that there's a specific team that's dedicated for issues and in dealing with that. Yeah, that's I think that's more of a function of customer service or support. There are obviously there's different branches. So um, most I've been in B2B marketing, I would say most of my career. So I've been listening for all of the conversations and then I will help train people in those specific functions on what to listen for. Mm -hmm. um, so if it is a customer service person, they can be monitoring these channels because, again, you need to know where your customers are having the conversations. So you, you don't need to monitor every single social network if your people aren't there. <laughs> You're going to be spending a whole lot of time listening to nobody. So again, you know, focus on where they are. Um, uh, just, you know, again, be work smart. And I think that's, again, you would pull in somebody like myself who's more of a general social listener to find out you know, from the get-go where your potential customers are, where your actual customers are, um, where your influencers are, and then you kind of trickle that down to all departments. Um, so you're listening to the right conversations. Yeah, I think in trying to be everywhere all the time is just absolutely ridiculous at this point. You, you just simply can't. You have to prioritize where you think your customer base is and where your best voice is. Um, Laura had a comment in the chat that you see that type of thing in certain nonprofits um, you know, that Planned Parenthood probably has a team like that, for example. I think that is something that's really interesting because even a larger nonprofit um, may not have the resources to deal with that, um, may not have the manpower. So if you're a small team, how can you really use listening effectively without spending all day, you know, <laughs> listening to all your listening tools? Well, I mean, always start small. So do some general listening, um, because once you find out that it's effective, you it's easy to find resources. Um, mm -hmm. I think once we know something works, we're, we're more than happy to throw money at it. It's just when there's that question mark, we don't, we don't know if it's going to be worth our time. Um, so again, yeah, go to start on one network, put your listening in place, see what's there. Um, and it, it may, you might not find anything, then you would move to the next network. But I wouldn't just go all in, you know, on every single Pinterest, Instagram, peach, Social whatever's out there, because um, you're just going to be overwhelmed. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and that's, that's interesting too, is that 
okay, so let's say you're in a fairly small organization or you're in an organization that still, for whatever reason, doesn't believe in social media. How do you use listening then as a tool to get your management to buy in to using social? Well, yeah, even if your company isn't on social, I would, without a doubt, your customers are. <laughs> so, you know, you could then um, build a case to say, hey, you know, I, I spent, you know, a couple hours yesterday looking on Twitter and look what I found, you know, screenshot it, pull in the data. Um, and it, it's really easy, especially, I mean, screenshots, I swear by them because they're undeniable. <laughs> yeah. You know, so I'm not just saying it because I, I, I personally want to get on social media. It's like, look, these are our actual customers, maybe even, you know, correlate that to your CRM, like whatever your, your content management database is. I was like, hey, this is Joe. Joe is on Twitter and he's talking to Susan, who is a potential customer. Like we need to jump into that conversation um, and just really connect the dots, make it really simple. Um, mm -hmm. And it's an, it's an easy case to make. Yeah. Yeah. And what about uh, if you're talking about maybe competitive analysis and listening, using listening tools for that? Yes, um, Rival IQ. If we're going to put tools Rival into the conversation, is amazing for monitoring your competitors. Um, and then, most definitely, that should be a part of your social listening strategy. Is not just competitors, but the industry. Um, see what's going on, what's trending, uh, what their customers are saying, because that's often an opportunity for you to jump in. Um, I, mm -hmm. When I was working for um, products like Nimble or other CRMs, I would always monitor for what our competitors are saying, because if they're having a horrible time, <laughs> that's when you can come in and save the day. <laughs> yeah, 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 and that's something, I mean, it isn't necessarily to use it as an attack mode, um, you know, but I think you can look at what people are saying about your competitor's product, and maybe you can find a flaw in their product that you could fix in yours. So Exactly, or even just how they phrase questions. Um, then you could use that in your content. Like if you some, you know, if you see they're always saying this, then that's a blog post. Um, mm -hmm. And I think I used to always advise our content team um, from social listening. Like you want to answer those unasked questions, um, and that social listening is amazing for finding that. Yeah, and just you know, kind of R and D, really. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Laura mentions that people may also have a policy of not engaging negative posts. What do you think about that idea that if you're hearing negativity out on the web um, through your listening, how do you respond to it and who should respond to it? I don't think not engaging is wise um, because those messages will be there and it just shows that you don't care. Um, mm -hmm. I always, if I see a negative post, I always take time to click through, see who it is, make sure it's a genuine person behind the avatar, um, see what else they're posting, because perhaps it is just a blanket tweet or message that they're sending out to you and all of your competitors that may not be worth your time, but spend the extra minutes to see what's behind the negative post. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and I would respond unless it seems to be like obvious trolling behavior. Um, and who should respond would be dependent on the type of question. Um, if it is something just about the product, you can perhaps send it. If you're a customer service person, perhaps show it to a manager first. Um, but it, you should have some kind of triage process in place to where it'll quickly get shuffled to the right entity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how else can we use social listening? Um, I'm thinking like content development, for example. Um, how can we listen to create good content that people actually care about? Um, I think, yeah, it comes down to, because, you know, if you're, perhaps you're, you know, you're a social listening tool, uh, people who aren't particularly aware of what social listening is, you have to kind of break that down into layman's terms. Like, what would you call it if you didn't know it was social listening? And that's an opportunity for a blog post. It's education. Um, so mm -hmm. think outside the box with, um, and I, I pull people, I'll pull my neighbors. <laughs> like, how do you, how, what do you think when you see this? Like, what do you call it? Um, ask your family and friends, then put in those listening tools, see, and then send out some tweets and see who's engaging. Um, Cause again, listening, you're trying to start, you're listening to conversations, but you also want to start conversations and then listen to the responses. So it doesn't always have to be passive. You can be very mm -hmm. proactive um, with your listening. 
And if you're a blogger, for example, you know, there's so much potential out there by just paying attention, um, you know, to what maybe is trending on a particular network um, without, you know, being too crazy about it. Um, I think there's a there are a lot of people that will, for example, hijack a hashtag while you're doing a Twitter chat, which may or may not be a good strategy. Um, let's no, talk a little bit about news is wrong. <laughs> there needs to be a campaign <laughs> against that. That's super annoying. <laughs> or if there's any event, um, yeah, just jumping on and sharing your content and just you know jumping into that stream without actually adding value is super. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Especially but without that's listening. Tools, um, like Nelson, what we were talking about earlier, to find out what is trending, what's being shared by your peers in your network um, does come in handy. So you know mm -hmm. what's interesting to them. And you would hope that if everybody's sharing it, you should maybe take the time to read it and um, add some commentary on it. Yeah, yeah. I noticed today, well, this morning, that there's a hashtag trending on Twitter. It's still trending called Let's Make Today Better Buy. And so it started with, you know, a lot of people coming up with ideas about how they could make today better and being generous and being thankful and doing all of these things. And then insinuated in it are all of these brands that are really putting out a lot of very, it's very ad focused content. Um, you know, we're seeing you Cinnabon put out, you could get cinnamon rolls and, you know, it's, it's really interesting to see how people try to do that. Um, it's kind of like, you know, when Domino's hashtag jacked why I stayed and it was because you had pizza. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess they're, they're kind of taking the, the easy way into that hashtagging when instead they could show that they're listening and they care by if someone's like, you know, today could be better by receiving a box of chocolates, then perhaps they could send that person a box of chocolates instead of right. just, you know, trying to push their product. Um, yeah, not really, they're, they're listening, but they're they're not listening, I guess, for them. They're just, um, yeah, hashtagging's wrong. <laughs> yeah, hashtagging's wrong. Uh, but on the other hand, now there are good examples, um, like the Oreo moment, which we've all, you know, those of us who are in the business anyway are all kind of blown away by that when the lights went out at the Super Bowl, Oreo was on it and posted a tweet that said you can still dunk in the dark. So is that hashtag jacking or is that taking advantage of the moment? Where's the line? But that they I think they added value. Like they had somebody who was, you know, quick on their feet and saw an opportunity to make a big splash. And I think that's the difference between instead of just saying, well, go to the 7-Eleven and buy Oreos. That'll make it better. You know, they actually, they were kind of funny. You know, they, they took the, so I yeah. guess in that context, um, it's still hashtagging, but they were adding value versus just um, pushing their own agenda. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I noticed that um, uh, Don Carter said in the chat that Twubs can suppress accounts who hashtag Jack. So don't do that or you won't be on Twubs. And I like Twelves. Twelves is a good it. hashtag tool. Yes, it is. We use it for chats. Uh, <laughs> and Laura Norvig says, get off my lawn. Remember the good old days when corporations didn't have a clue what Twitter was? <laughs> yes. The, everybody's because marketers come in and ruin everything. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. And I'm, I'm actually not sure that brands still get Twitter. It's not. Twitter is not an intuitive network still, I think, for a lot of people to understand how to use it, um, especially if they're into broadcasting, you know, which is one of the the seven sins of Twitter, I guess. Yeah, I think because people miss that all social networks are social, which is about people and conversation and engagement. It's a communication channel. It's not, you know, just <laughs> it's not a broadcast channel. It's not. It's two way. Um, mm -hmm. That's. Hence, social. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's easy to abuse, but if you kind of step back and work, okay, what what should I really be doing here? Um, be social requires uh, engagement, listening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So let's go back to content development just for a minute and talk about if you were gonna develop, say, a content calendar, could you do that through effective social listening? And what would that kind of, 
What would that process look like? Be right on the spot. Be brilliant now. Be brilliant, yes. <laughs> no, you can most definitely build out your content calendar from social listening. Um, I, and I, I do, uh, content curation and, and then advising um, the content team. Um, as far as is a calendar, I think that's still something I wouldn't dictate that by perhaps what you're listening to unless your business is very centralized around certain events that happen. Um, mm -hmm. I think your calendar should be something that you determine internally, um, but you can most definitely find out what is important to your community um, and add value to the conversations that they're having and then start meaningful conversations um, mm -hmm. by listening. So. For, yeah, I would. It starts with um, knowing your customers. Always do an audit first. Um, if you're in a sales environment, it's like the sales that you won and the sales that you lost. Uh, work out what happened in both scenarios. Um, set out your search terms, um, and then pick through the data. Mm -hmm. well, I think you can, if, from my perspective, you can do a social content calendar based on what you've learned from listening. For example, if you hear that your competitor is maybe they're falling down in a particular area, then you can say, okay, over the next week, you know, I wanna come up with some content that's gonna be around this particular thing that shows our benefits or shows, um, you know, the comparison infographics, I think are a good thing that you can do really quickly just based on social listening. But then you still have to plan that. Um, I think with content curation in particular, some people will curate too tightly so that you'll get this long stream of all of this content and it's inundating and it doesn't flow very well. So I think that's where a content calendar comes in handy, um, which, you know, there's, there's good sides and downsides to content calendars as well. No, I agree. I like your example of knowing, if, you know, basing it off something like being reactive with something that's happening in your industry or perhaps a competitor. Um, and you would hope that with the content that you're curating and creating are saying similar things. So it's harmonious because you don't want to be writing content about shoes, but then you're curating content, you know, about pants or something. You're like, whatever, you know, <laughs> right. <laughs> it needs to at least play nicely together. Yeah. Do my pants go with my shoes? Exactly. These are really yeah, important maybe things. do my pants match my shoes? That's important. <laughs> People get really mad with the brown belts and the black shoes. <laughs> Apparently, I have no idea. But being, you know, such a fashion model, it's really well anyway. Um, <laughs> I think I think that there's a lot that people can do with curation and and the other kind of listening is listening to yourself. Um, I think people tend not to step back and look at their messaging on a periodic basis and go, okay, are we on message or are we just kind of throwing up whatever we can think of? Um, no, I agree. And I also think tone is important. Um, I think a mm -hmm. lot of people can kind of have a very passive um, and not very engaging tone and they, they're not even aware. Um, and they can do simple things in just the titles of their social shares um, and generate a lot more engagement um, just by being maybe a little bit more positive or inquisitive. Um, so mm -hmm. yeah, it's definitely important to audit. Um, so I, I love tools like Buffer. We can quickly go in and see what's working and what's not. And then you kind of can dive deeper. What, why did that work? Was it because it had, you know, uh, a dancing cat gif? <laughs> or was <laughs> it, you know, was I, was I telling a, a joke or did I ask a question? And then you can then mimic that. Um, because you don't need to reinvent the wheel every time. If you see something that's working, then. Mm -hmm. And also go through for your social listening. If you see a post that a competitor posted, um, and also Rival IQ is another tool that's great for that, they'll let you know, like, hey, your competitor posted something and it had 200 shares, and you want to dive in and see, well, why is it so popular? Um, and then mm. you can go in and try and uh, capitalize on that. Yeah, yeah. I think tools like Buffer, Twitter Analytics, too, are really great. Even Facebook insights, if you dig into them, um, you know, we do that in Sprout Social and, and dig in to see over time, you know, what the most engaged posts are and, and how that's working. And then you can think about that when you're going to create new content um, and maybe set up some listening around those particular things. If something that, say, your competitor is writing that's getting really hot and they're getting tons of mentions, you may want to set up listening tools around that 
to kind of find out, you know, what's what's going on there? What's the dynamic that's really driving that? Because we kind of guess otherwise and guessing. Yeah, it's um, there's no need to guess. We have so much um, data at our fingertips these days. Um, we should always be making educated choices. Yeah. Well, theoretically, yeah. <laughs> I have to say, I don't, I'm not always great at that, but I try. <laughs> um, Steve Payne says he uses Twitonomy. I don't know if you know that one, but it down for downloading Twitter info. I have not used that one, but I love finding new tools. So I'm going to write that down. Me too. I'm going to go look it up afterwards. Thanks. What, um, sorry. What other tools can we leave people with that are really great listening tools that they can use for multiple networks? Both of you and I are kind of Twitter centric. So if we're going to listen to other networks, the rest of the world, um, what other tools can can you come up with? And if anybody else has new tools, please post them in the chat. Um, well, if you have the budget, uh, Sysimos is amazing. Um, it crawls every network and its access to historical data um, is worth the money. But again, it is very expensive. So that's like Sysmos is way over here. <laughs> have, you know, tools like Mention and BuzzSumo, um, which are, are much more budget friendly and, you know, for the average user, just as effective. Um, it depends what you're mm -hmm. looking for, like sourcing influencers. So there's all sorts of listening. Um, that's one of my main um, roles at Pure Matter is to find, um, I guess, influencers in training. <laughs> they may not be influencers yet, but it's kind of like catching those people before they, they hit the big time. Um, mm -hmm. So I use a lot of tools like Little Bird, um, oh. Clear, to kind of see people who are, you know, they're amazing subject matter experts, um, but perhaps they're not big on Twitter, but we can coach them um, into that role. Uh, so yeah, so those are kind of like my go-tos as well as like mention that a sales prodigy is a great tool. And I but it's they now have a desktop version. So if anybody checked them out before and they were annoyed that they were only on their phone, I can now get it on desktop and they have a Hootsuite integration. <laughs> hmm. um, and it's free. <laughs> and it's free. We like free. Free is always, always good. good. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's one of my, my stable tools. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the only one I'd add to that is social mention. Um, which is kind of my go-to because it goes across all the platforms and it's free. Um, their alerts aren't the greatest because they really haven't updated in a while. But if I need to search for something really quickly and I want to know it in real time, um, social mention, BuzzSumo, those are those are my two go-tos. Yeah. Yes, or um, Topsy, which isn't around anymore, but I used to love that tool. Mm. Um, and I haven't really found an equivalent yet um, to replace it, but. That was a great one. Right, right. Well, I wanted to uh, wrap this up and just let people know where they can find you and how they can connect with you. So Twitter, I am always on uh, Twitter. My phone is always in my hand. That's kind of the easiest place to look at me, at Rachel o. Miller. Um, and that handle is consistent across most networks. Um, mm. I, and I'm happy to answer any questions anybody has. Um, and if you have any new tools, I always have my my ears out looking for for new ones. So I would appreciate any tool tips. Oh, that's great. And thanks, Kristen, for posting the link to Clear. I didn't know about that one, so I'll be checking it out. Cool. Yeah, Clear is a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. Oh, great. That's what I need is more tool, more toys to play with. <laughs> yeah, you can spend hours in clear. My favorite feature, um, you can uh, localize people. So you can say, oh, I want to find everybody in San Jose uh, who mm -hmm. are interested in this topic. And then you can drill down and see who they're talking to. So you can quickly identify like a new core group of friends to start engaging with. <laughs> oh, that's great. That's really great. Well, thank you again. And I'm going to pause the recording. And if people want to stick around, that's cool.